The next game we're going to look at was a tournament held in New York in May of 1933, the purpose of which was to select the Olympic team that would represent the United States. Or the Olympiad team as it's called. Now if you don't know I.A. Horowitz, you really should. Horowitz is a big name in American chess. Israel Albert is what the I.A. stands for, but he always went by I.A. I've read many, many books by I.A. Horowitz. He was really, um, you know, I, he wrote a big book on, on opening theory, among others. So he's a real strong player. Well, this, this was uh, Denker's opponent in the Olympic selection tournament in New York. Game was played May 9th, 1933. So we have the Queen's Gambit. And Horowitz picks the Slav defense. And the idea is to support the D-pawn from the wing here. So that he can, uh, in the event of a pawn takes pawn, he can capture with his C-man and still maintain a strong central point. And meanwhile, he avoids blocking, like with a move like E6, he avoids blocking his uh, bishop, which is what happens in the Queen's Gambit declined. So that's the idea of the Slav defense, to leave the queen's bishop unimpeded, to maintain a solid central point, and um, perhaps to find a way to attack this c4 pawn in the near future. Now, the drawback of the Slav defense is it does tend to uh, leave black with slower development. And hitting back with c5 obviously loses a move. And now the c6 square is the knight's favorite square, so that's no longer available. So as with all openings, it has its pros and it has its cons. Denker played knight c3, knight f6, and with knight f3 we have the three knights variation. You can probably guess why it's called the three knights variation. Now with e6 we go to a semi-slav uh, defense. Moving both e6 and c6 out. And so the idea is um, to complete your development and look for a chance to play d takes c4 later on. And then after bishop takes c4, you're playing b5. And once you've played b5, you can play bishop to b7. So that's kind of the thinking in the semi-slav. And so it's a sharp game, but it does have very solid foundations. It does focus on the center of the board. Of course, the light squared bishop is temporarily blocked and caged in. So that might be a uh, liability, and it is very theoretical. And of course, white has many options 
to avoid Black's ideas. Well, Bishop G5 is played. Yeah, there may be some similarities between um, this and the Karakhan and the Scandinavian defense, particularly with these pawns here. The difference being in a Scandinavian, this bishop usually comes out before those pawns are pushed. Knight B to D7 transposes to the Queen's Gambit declined knight defense. E3, and after Queen A5, we have another transposition. This is the Cambridge Springs defense. Um, well, it was really favored by Harry Nelson Pillsbury, so you'll sometimes... Not so much these days, but in days gone by, it was known as Pillsbury's Variation. But uh, the idea, of course, this pin here is now broken. And Black applies a pin of his own. Exploiting the fact that the white queen's bishop is no longer able to reach d2. So we really like this idea for black. Well, white answers with knight d2, breaking the pin with his knight. And when we see D takes C4, that is Akiba Rubinstein's variation. Bishop takes F6. Knight takes F6. Knight takes C4. Attacks the queen. Sending it back to C7. A another place that you'll often see this queen when you have this queen side pawn structure. Whether you're dealing with a Karo Khan or a Scandinavian or some other line. Bishop C2. Uh, almost as often, rook c1 is played, and I'm sure we'll see rook c1 here shortly. Bishop e7, castles, castles, and there it is, rook c1. Just because there are pieces here doesn't mean this is not a viable and valid attack. Remember, rooks love open files, and if they can't find an open file. They love halfway open files. And if they can't find one of those, usually they'll get behind a pawn and make one by pushing the pawn up the board. So rook d8 also stands on a half open file and looks at his opponent's queen. Queen c2 immediately steps out of the view of that rook and onto the diagonal, the b1, h7 diagonal. Now bishop d7 completes his development. Both sides developed. Both sides with decent uh, presence in the center. White's pieces are slightly more mobile. This is a bad bishop. Therefore, white might have the, the tiniest advantage here. He played a3 in the database. Only slightly more popular is knight e5. Knight e5. 
Bishop F, uh, excuse me, Bishop E8 is played. Bishop F8 is the most common move. And I'm not really sure. I mean, Bishop E8 makes sense because it again opens the line for the rook, but I'm not sure what the purpose of Bishop F8 would be. But it is the more common move. And with b4, we reach the first unique position in the database. And both sides holding their own very well. Rook a c8 gets the last rook into the mix. And knight to a5. A very interesting move. Why knight to a5? Where is he going from there? What does it do? Well, it opens this line. He may be planning on relocating here. That might make some sense. Knight to d5, offering a knight trade. That offer is accepted. Now knight to b3 is indeed played. The knight now has access to c5. If that gets cut off, perhaps he'll come over to the king's side of the board via d2 and f3. Bishop d6 forms the battery against h2. So therefore g3 is played. Important weakness is created on h3. A lot of times you like to get your bishop or your queen in that hole. Well, bishop d7 comes as no surprise then. Now knight c5 is in fact played and bishop h3 is in fact played. Rook f e1. I would gather he'll get his bishop on the long diagonal and maybe try to push up the board here. Now rook to f8. I, I mean bishop to f8. I'm not real clear on the purpose of bishop to f8. Unless he is for some reason planning on moving his g-man. Hello moon man 105. You are a personality. Isn't everybody a personality? Okay, A4. He's expanding on the queen side. G6 is indeed played. Queen B2. Hmm. Okay. He's wanting to pry open the C file. Queen E7 gets that queen out of the view of the rook immediately, if not sooner. Rook C3. Will he double his rooks on the C file? Ah, uh, did I star in the television, the hit television show wings? <laughs> I never even heard of that hit television show. What did that hit television show hit? So black as well, trying to improve his pieces. White does, in fact, 
double his rooks on the halfway open file. Bishop g7 now. Only this pawn obstructing the attack of the bishop. Knight to d3. This pawn has got to be coming to b5. So I would anticipate a6 to stop it. Instead, he retreats his bishop, uh, his rook back to d8. I'm a little confused by that move. And white does not take the opportunity to play b5. Instead, he hits this bishop. Moonman says a6 would not have stopped b5. Well, you can still play b5. That's true. And capture here, and obviously you cannot take. But it does um, help to defend the position over there on the queen side. And so. Anyway, knight f4 strikes at the bishop, bishop to f5, bishop to d3, interrogates that bishop again, and the bishops are traded off. Now rook to a8, now b5, c takes b5, queen takes b5. So, again, white's pieces are much more mobile than our blacks. The rooks are coming to the seventh rank. The queen will soon be in peril. White's queen will soon be able to take the b-man captive. Well, rook d7 helps to defend that. Rook c8 check, though, now that the back rank is slightly weaker. And now the bishop has to retreat into a pin. Now white would love to get this knight into the game. It'd be good to play knight c5 or knight e5. The peace moving sounds make you very happy. Well, I'm happy that you're happy. <laughs> I'm glad that you're happy. So one of these two moves would be probably pretty nice. He played knight c5, attacking the rook. And the rooks are traded. And now this pawn is left unprotected and can be captured with a hit on the queen. Uh, he captures with his own queen instead. Guess that's just as good. I would have rather struck at the queen. He's got a move. This is still hot. So he would have to move, if he wants to keep the D-man, he would have to move, say, uh, to G5 to defend. So I prefer, personally, not that I'm anywhere near as good as Denker was. I'll never be as good as Denker was, but... I prefer knight takes pawn instead of queen takes pawn. A5 is played. Knight to D7. 
obstructs the queen's defense of the D man and also puts heat on that bishop. H5 is played and the pawn is captured. Bishop to G7. Queen to B5 maintains the defense of the knight while breaking the pin. King H7. Pawn to H4. It's just a matter of time here. White with two extra pawns, one of which is a passed pawn. Queen E7. Knight C5. Bishop F6. Queen uh, D6. Uh, D7. Black wants to keep his pieces. Knight e4 striking at the bishop. King defends. Knight d6. Bishop e7. Knight e8 check. King g8. Pawn to d5. Bishop b4, pawn to d6, king to h7, queen to c7. <laughs> I like it. He says, go ahead and take my knight. Feel free. Here uh, the game ended. Black resigned. If you capture the knight and the pawn pushes, attacking the queen, so you don't have time to bring your bishop here to defend the promotion square. And then, of course, what else is there if you don't? The only other thing is probably to just sack your bishop for the pawn. There's nothing else. So, there you have it. Looks like Arnold Denker is misaligned here in the picture. I just noticed that. I'm such a professional, aren't I? Let's fix that. No, oh, that's more betterer. Now he's short. get it right. Did not quite get this right. What it'll have to do. All right. Anyway. So there's a nice game, another nice game by um, Arnold Denker. His accuracy in this game was 97.31. Best move ratio, 56.3%. So very strong showing.